Eliza. Okay. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, yes. I don't know how long. Yeah. <coughs> but I, I don't. Yes, it's very hard. Yeah. I don't think he thinks Notes. the same. <laughs> I think you've heard this. Yeah. Not quite as often as I have. But <coughs> The relaxing. Students, yes. Hello. <laughs> Luciana Galicia. She works in okay. corn breeding here in the station also. Okay. And here finished her PhD I need a bit more water. <laughs> recently. <laughs> okay. Where did you get the water from? Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. I'm Haran. Nice Luciana. to meet you. Corn breeder here. Station. Okay, you. Met you guys yesterday. <laughs> Hi, I'm Haram. Nice to meet you. Hi, my name is Haram. Nice to meet you. Are you work here? Surely, yeah. And what, what do you do? You sorry? In sunflower. Uh, the, the oh, sunflower. Cars. Okay. We don't yes, grow three, sunflower three, four, where four we live because we're in wheat. the south of Australia wheat. and we don't have any summer uh, crop. Here we have for us, two million uh, yeah, in you've sunflower. Got many. Corn, yeah. wheat. Corn, wheat. Uh, for us? Forage. Forage. Crops. Yeah, okay. And sunflower. In the more north so what sort of, of us, crops? so we live in the south, uh, the, the more north, are, they guess, do grow sunflower and soy and, and other crops. And I don't know what yeah. else. <laughs> Very big crops. And the they also one? grow right grass. Um, yeah. cotton. And the other, I, I know they work cotton, in lollium. Maize, and they work sorghum, in salinity. Lollium. And ah, maybe the same. sunflower. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's in, in that's salinity, further north where we have okay. summer rain because of the it's tropical like conditions. The and yeah. the wind and breathing. Whereas in the south, we um, only have winter rain. And no we summer have rain. Uh, we sell and it's 40 varieties to the farmers. Oh, okay. No water. The you can't corn grow. and sunflower do not. Crops. But the wheat <laughs> breeding, yes. So. <coughs>
Right? Okay. Well, thank you everybody to be, for being here. I will introduce Harman Ruiz. Um, he has a PhD in the School of Agriculture in the University of Melbourne, Australia. And now he's principal consultant and director of Crop Facts. And he has great experience in the study and research of dry land cropping system in the northern, in northern Victoria, uh, including research and demonstration programs dealing with soil conservation, dry land salinity, crop production practices, wet control, nutrition, disease management, farming system, including no tillage conservation farming practices, and pasture establishment and maintenance. Well, welcome. It's a pleasure. To, for, for us uh, that you could bring a seminar. Mm. So start whenever okay. you want. Thank you and thank you for that very nice introduction. We've really enjoyed being in Argentina. I was here 45 years ago as a youngster with a backpack on and Argentina is very different to 45 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, But we are well, of course, Argentinians are very nice people and we're having a very good time, even though Anne and I speak almost no Spanish. But everyone has been very welcoming and very friendly. And it's been great to be able to have a look at what sort of agriculture takes place here in Argentina and compare it a little bit with what we are doing in, in Australia. So. As was explained, I'm, a, I'm an agronomist, so I worked advising farmers in their crop production systems, and we've now retired from that, but we have also did a lot of research work for the Grain Research Development Corporation, which is our main source of funding. So all farmers in Australia, all grain farmers in Australia, pay 1% of their total income to this grain research organisation. And you cannot say no, that everyone does it, so it's legislated. And that is a very large amount of money that is available for research and development every year. And farmers actually decide on who and where and what the priorities are for that research work. In Australia, we think it's a very good model. <coughs> and the only people that I've heard complain about it are the big corporate farmers because they think they can do their own research. But that gives you a little bit of background on a slightly different model to what you have in Argentina in terms of funding research. So I'm going to explain a little bit about farming in the region that Anne and I work in. But the purpose in particular is, can we continue farming the way that we are without glyphosate? So the Grain Research Development Corporation have funded this project for Anne and I to go and talk to farmers in different regions of the world and we've been to Europe and to Canada and now we're in Argentina to see can we continue this high productive system that we have and that you have without glyphosate in the system. And it was especially interesting in Europe and I'll show you a few slides of there where we talked with a lot of farmers in, in Spain, France, Germany, Holland, as well as in, in the UK, as well as researchers. So after that very long introduction. Mm -hmm. So Anne and I live here and that is where we work. So that's in southern Australia where primarily we only grow winter crops because in summer we have very little rain and it's extremely hot. You know, we have many days over 40 degrees and the evapotranspiration rates are enormous. So unless you've got irrigation, then you can't, you can't grow um, crops over the summer. The, um, Australia has very few rivers, real rivers, and even this one there's only a small river compared to what you have and that is called the Murray and there are a few um, places with irrigation along the river, but it's primarily for olives and almonds and, and other high value products. Western Australia is also very, it's the same kind of climate that we have, so very hot summers and dry winters. They grow a lot of grain 
And in the north, it's more similar to what you have here. We do do double cropping because this is in the tropics and we get summer rainfall as well as um, winter rainfall. So in this area, they do grow sorghum and cotton, cotton and maize. Not soybeans are grown, but it's not a huge crop. And they also grow winter um, wheat and barley. So uh, just a little bit of data along the top. So looking at the overall production of our grains in Australia, and these are the main crops that we are growing. Oh, sorry. Oh. Um, I'll well, partly explain that, but our annual rainfall in this region is between 350 and 400 mils per year. And the growing season, so that's when from planting to harvest, is about 230 to 250. So it's a low production region with the average wheat yields being somewhere between two and a half and three and a half tonne to the hectare. And with the pulse crops that we grow and canola around one and a half to two tonne. Sorry, yeah. So <laughs> one thing that is quite different in our system, I think, is that we have really very variable rainfall. So you can see in these years, we had extremely low rainfall during the growing season. So this year, only 70 millimetres, and it's impossible to grow crops with that low rainfall because well, there's nowhere near enough transpiration. But then also, we can have very wet years, and in those years, it is much too wet. So this year, with the La Nina event that you are having, and it's dry here, it's wet at home, and this year it's extremely wet, and farmers are very concerned that the soils are waterlogged, they're just about to start flowering, and that harvest will be very wet, and they won't have a very good harvest. And already some of the pulse crops, such as chickpeas and lentils, are not doing very well. <coughs> now, just a little bit of history, what Australia used to look like, and this applies to Western Australia and Northern Australia as well. So in 1982, when we had a severe drought, we had this dust storm that came across all of the, the southern region, and most of that landed on top of Melbourne, which was... a uh, obviously a very bad thing, but at the same time it was a very good thing because people became aware of what farming was <laughs> happening on the farms in relation to um, soil erosion. But we also have very wet years when it becomes very hard to, to farm at all and to especially during harvest. <clears throat> so we do use uh, some modelling in relation to working with farmers on what their production potential is and a very simple one that Victor Sadras has been working on too and most of you will know Victor so this is actually a graph from one of Victor's papers and where we plot the amount of water that's available, so that is from the rainfall as well as from the stored water at sowing. And we plot the yield for each individual field and you can see that there is a upper limit to that. And there's an equation for that and some fields are doing exceptionally well of getting very close. But these fields uh, obviously had much higher potential but they didn't reach that and then it's up to the agronomist to be working with the farmer and trying to work out why those actually occurred. Was it because of disease or not enough nitrogen or other issues? We also use crop simulation modelling as developed by our national research organisation, CSIRO, where we look at the potential yield during the season, and this is the line, the green line is without additional nitrogen, with the blue line is if you apply more nitrogen to the crop and then it's up to the farmer to decide what sort of risk does he want to take 
in relation to putting more nitrogen fertilizer out. So that's probability theory. And we're finding that people in general struggle to understand probabilities. And that is a real problem with working with farmers in trying to get people to understand probabilities. And if they did understand probabilities, then we also wouldn't have any casinos and everything else because obviously, <laughs> you know, without that understanding of probability, I think farmers find it hard to use this model. Well, so I'm sure that Argentina looked, didn't look any different to this 40, 50 years ago. We had sheep and wheat in our system. We, mul we multiple cultivations, and you can see there's a moldboard plough behind there. The ground was long fallowed, we call it, for nine months preceding. It was completely kept bare to conserve as much of the rainfall as possible. Because of all the ploughing and to control the weeds, crops were sown late. We had very poor soils, the organic matter was breaking down and compaction. We had low water infiltration and on sloping country or in flat country but with, with um, sandy soils we had a lot of erosion. So at the moment it looks more like that and that I'm sure that you're very familiar with that. Everything, no tillage is as an estimate, we would say that more than 95% of farmers are 100% no-till, so there's no cultivation. We do full stubble retention. We grow our crops continuously, so there's no more fallow years. We rotate wheat with barley, a pulse crop, and then followed by canola, and then start with wheat again. We do sow dry, so if it hasn't rained by the 1st of May, farmers will sow their crops because the window for the optimum sowing time is very small and in some years that doesn't work because it doesn't rain at all. So then the seed has been sown but there is no crop because we get those very low rainfall. And over the summer period, Glyphosate is the main herbicide for summer weed control. But I'll get back to that a bit more. So I'm going to give you an example from one of the farms that I worked on as an agronomist. It's 5,300 hectares. It's a family farm. With, um, there were two brothers with their families who worked on that farm. Now there's only one brother. but. The, the, the wife of the other brother is still on the farm and still works there too. So it also runs sheep and you can see the numbers there. These are the crops they grow but they also grow hay as a commercial crop and that's, most of that is sold to Japan and China. Now j just showing you the landscape a little bit, is, can you see that okay? That's the, that's the cedar. Oh, sorry. It doesn't matter. I can't go back, I don't think. No. Do I need to go back? Yes. Okay. All right. Happy now? Yeah. <laughs> But one really interesting thing that I found is that we could be in Argentina, couldn't we? Yeah. It's flat. What are those trees? They're all eucalypts. <laughs> and you got eucalypts everywhere. I mean, Anne and I feel like if we're at home and we're going, when we look outside, it's completely flat, beautiful skies when the sun's going down or coming up and yeah, eucalypts. <laughs> and, and it's dry here this year, so that's the same as it is at home. So, yeah. Don't so, don't have the kangaroos though. Having no cattle. Can't, no, yeah. we have sheep, but no cattle. And and really, to be honest, the sheep numbers have gone way down. As the old the older farmers all had sheep, and they like working with sheep. 
the young farmers, as soon as harvest is over, they pack the car up and they go to the beach with their family and they don't want to be on the farm for the next two months when it's very hot and dry and they go to their holiday house on the beach. <laughs> Anne says I'm over, over saying that. But on this particular farm, it's definitely the case. They do have sheep. Okay. They take them, do they take the sheep on holidays? <laughs> all all, all 15,000 of them. <laughs> so this is the farm, and, uh, the farm profit and loss statement for that, oh, for the last, almost the last decade, for the particular farm that I'm talking about. So you can see here, the grey columns are the total income. This is 2020, 2019. And this is the total expenses. And the total expenses includes everything on the farm except for taxation. And you can see that in some years, the farm makes a large amount of profit. And in some years, the very dry years, the farm makes a very large loss. But the last two bars are the average. And people may say, oh, look, there's only about $400,000 profit which is 10% of the total um, income. But at the same time, that is the total financial. So there's no other cost to come out. So it is actually quite a profitable business to be running. In, well, just another quick thing. In Australia, farmers pay tax, of course, but it's calculated out as the three-year average. So they don't pay annual tax. They pay it annually, but as an average over three years. So you can see in these three years, the average would be reduced, the average profit, because of that large loss. So that was five years, not five minutes. Did I say minutes? <laughs> OK, the changes in farming practices. So you. Certainly no-till has improved the quality of the soil. The soil is definitely much better than it was before, and that's also because of reduced compaction. We have virtually no soil erosion anymore. We are much better at conserving any summer rainfall for potential crops. We also have much better timely operations, so because farmers are sowing dry, and they've got the machinery is much bigger, so they can do everything on time. And there's uh, greatly reduced competition from weeds in the whole farming system. But at the same time, it means we are very, very <coughs> dependent on um, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, and also on in insecticides. Just a, a little bit more about, well, a little bit about herbicide resistance crops. So we do grow a lot of canola and we've got simazine um, or the triazine group resistance in canola also clearfield which is group two which and i think you're working in a b and c groups is that right mm -hmm. or do you work in numbers I work in chemical names, I think. yeah but all chemicals are in groups so this is the sulfonyl urea group so the IMI group is in, in that, sorry, the IMI group is, yeah, that's the IMI group. And glyphosate is, we also have glyphosate resistant canola. Mm -hmm. With lentils, we also have herbicide resistance, but not in the other crops, okay? We, because we've been using glyphosate for such a long time, and quite large quantities of it. In 1998, we found our first lolium resistance in ryegrass, and about 15 years later in brome grass, and in the last five years, we've found it in, in wild radish as well as in wild oats. So we, we're starting to get the same kind of herbicide resistance to glyphosate that you have. Further north in Australia, we, so this is where the summer cropping takes place and I think you're familiar with most of these weeds and so very similar to Argentina in northern Australia, we're getting extensive 
um, glyphosate resistance, which is becoming a real problem in terms of crop production systems. <coughs> in Australia, farmers can get their um, plants tested, so before they decide whether to apply a herbicide, they can collect, this is an example in ryegrass, they can collect a small ryegrass plant and with as much roots on it as possible, but they can cut the tops of the leaves off and they send that to a laboratory. The laboratory plants those, those plants into trays with soil and as soon as the ryegrass has developed its new leaves, they spray them with a wide range of different herbicides and then the farmer gets back a <coughs> rating or survival and a rating of resistance. So that, for example, triple R means that it's 100% um, resistant to the FOP group of chemistry. And you can see here, we've got ryegrass that is also resistant to glyphosate. So, th and this is a tool that quite a few farmers use before they actually spray the crops. So farmers are starting to look at alternative practices to using glyphosate and it's not because they're concerned that it will be banned but primarily because of resistance. So we call that double knock, so they spray first with glyphosate and then follow that up with paraquat to pick up any survivors from the glyphosate, so two weeks later. Some farmers are finding and the research is still a little bit um, it hasn't properly decided yet whether this works, but they think that sowing east-west gives you a higher yield because there's more light interception within for, for the crop itself. So there's more shading in between the row and that should be acting like a, a well, the ryegrass growing in the row would not develop or grow as quickly. Hay is being used as a herbicide resistance management, so it, the crops are cut for hay um, at the optimum time before the ryegrass has set seed. Some farmers are trying to only burn the windrow directly behind the harvester, but on the windy day that always will spread through the rest of the field, so that doesn't work. Mm. And <coughs> Some farmers have got stripper fronts, which I'm sure that some of your farmers will have as well. So they only cut the head off, you know, the flowering head or the head with grain and leaves the stubble very high, which is also more competition within the row because of shading. Um, weed seed destructors on the back of harvesters, the two big plates that grind everything that comes out of the back of the harvester. So you can imagine it slows down the harvest a little bit, but all the wheat seeds are ground, pulverised, so there's very little um, distribution of, of weeds. And, on, well, you have the wheat seeker as well, and some farmers are trying that out. <coughs> so as I said before, we use, it for, we use glyphosate for summer wheat control. We could have depending on how much rain we get, we can get up to three applications. We also use paraquat and diquat, especially after glyphosate, to make sure that nothing survives. And in ready roundup canola, we can have three applications of glyphosate in crops. So we are extensive users of glyphosate. And as you are, I'm sure you're very well of aware, there's increased community concern everywhere on the use of glyphosate. And that is especially focused on the Economic Union, the EU, where they, are, or they had a, it was on the statutes to, well, it was going to be a decision by the Economic Union Parliament in 2020, but because of the Ukraine war that was then put off, but the next meeting is going to be at the end of this year, <coughs> and the farmers that we met and the consultants are very concerned that the Economic Union will ban the use or ban further uses of glyphosate at the end of this year. And 
In some countries it's already severely restricted, such as in Austria, France, Germany, and even in Vietnam, and of course in Sri Lanka as well, and we all know what happened in Sri Lanka a few months ago when there were riots in the street because there was not enough food. Um, a little bit more about glyphosate and AMPA. AMPA is the breakdown product of glyphosate. We've done, my opinion is that we haven't done enough in Australia to actually determine where are the high residues and why are those fields so high with particular, with residues of glyphosate and AMPA. And the other thing is that I haven't, even though we've got a range here, we don't know whether that is high or not high and we haven't got anything to compare it to. And what does levels like that actually mean for residues in the grain or what does that residue, residues like that actually mean in relation to the soil biology? Does Roundup have an impact on the soil biology or not? So we've talked a lot with farmers about the practices that they can do to rely, to rely less on glyphosate and this is just an example for one particular weed being lolium. And they really decided that there are some things that they can do which has a high level of control on farms such as more hay production. The weed seed destructors they were very happy with as well except that it really slows down harvest and other knockdown herbicides being herbicides that control everything such as paraquat and, and diquat and a few others are working but depending on the resistance status that is going to be very dependent on how well Roundup will control those weeds. I haven't met a farmer yet who wants to go back to the mold board plough and we talked with all the farmers in, in France and Germany and in, they don't want to go back to ploughing either <coughs> because it will dramatically change their rotations in Europe and not so much for us, but if we started mold board ploughing again, we're going to get massive erosion occurring. So are there other herbicides on the market? There are some, but they certainly don't have the same efficacy that, that Roundup has or glyphosate has, so there are different issues there. Crop competition will work a little bit. Remote sensing for wheat patches, I think this will really change in the next decade with, in relation to remote sensing and targeting specific sites to control weeds on. And well, we talked about weed seed destructors, better um, sensing systems, inter-road tillage, weed wipers, shielded sprays. We've seen that here too, so everyone around the world is trying to work on that and develop a program that is as good as glyphosate, but that's going to be difficult. So just very briefly, just a few slides from Europe. Have you got any questions now for Australia or we talk about that a bit later? Happy? Okay. <coughs> So in, in the EU, glyphosate can only be used by no-till or min-till farmers. If you are a conventional farmer who ploughs, then you can't use glyphosate. It's only used prior to sowing or very shortly, like within one or two days after sowing the crop. <coughs> and it's also allowed to be used for terminating cover crops. But all the other uses, such as desiccation, are banned in, well, especially in France. In Germany, they can still do it. When we are in, in Canada, before we came to Argentina, nearly 80 or 90 percent of their crops are desiccated before harvest because they are concerned about um, the, the um, on, on, onset of winter with snow. So they crop desiccate nearly everything and they, there's testing starting to take place and many Canadian farmers are concerned that they will stop the pre or the desiccation pre-harvest in Canada. 
So in France, there's very strict regulations <coughs> to only allow 1,080 of gram active of glyphosate. <coughs> in Germany, it's quite a bit higher. And in France, the farmers have to report every insecticide, fungicide, as well as herbicide, and then they have to use a table to see how much they can use of each product and how many times they're allowed to use it each year. And that is policed, or policed, it's, it's monitored that farmers do that and they have to do it because otherwise they don't get the subsidies. And if half of your income comes from subsidies, then you are very willing to do all these things because <laughs> it's a big boost to your income. And our farmers, and I'm sure your farmers, will never have the subsidies that they get in the EU. <clears throat> Similar to what we learned yesterday is that in France it's very restricted in the um, use around small villages of using pesticides and at the moment it's only a five metre boundary and yesterday we heard that in this region it was a thousand and ninety six metres or something. Ninety five. Ninety six. Oh good. And, and I love that number, you know, that is a really simple number to use, 1,096. <laughs> Not 1,000 metres, but 1,096. So in Europe, at, well, in France, at the moment it's five metres, and, and I can understand if you lived in that house and you saw a boom spray coming along here and only five metres from your fence, that you are concerned. Because a lot of these people are not farmers, they do other things. And that buffer zone is going to be increased to 150 metres, which is not 1,096, <laughs> it's a lot, le lot less. But the fields are very small. I mean, a lot of the fields are only 50, 70 hectares and not necessarily hundreds of hectares. Cover crops are very common in both France and also in Spain and, well, in the whole of the EU and farmers use glyphosate two days prior to sowing. So you can see that that crop is being sown and two days ago, bef before that, two days prior to that, they um, sprayed that field with, with glyphosate. So and he's using a disc drill to do that. Um, Yesterday we saw a biogas plant when we were driving around here. They're very common in parts of Europe because farmers are investing in being part of a biogas plant because it means if they've got a lot of weeds in the field, they can either cut it or they can, cut, they can grow a specific crop in a field with weeds for the, with a lot of biomass such as hemp and then sell that or take it to the biogas plant. So that. And there are a lot of biogas plants in France and in Germany. And is there any in Spain? There would be, wouldn't there? Maybe not. <clears throat> so in Germany, 40% um, of, the, of the arable land, so where they grow grains, gets at least one application of glyphosate. Without glyphosate, the area of ploughing will increase from 38 to 72%. And they are, and the cost as calculated to German farmers will be somewhere in that range if glyphosate is taken off the market. And I think it's really important for other countries to do those kind of calculations as well to at least help the politicians and understand what the economic impact would be if glyphosate was, was banned. There's only two or three slides on Canada. It's um, well, quite in the area where we did most of our visiting. It's very different to here, but that's it. So glyphosate is used extensively pre-sowing or immediately post-sowing before crop emergence. Um, in GM canola, always two or three applications, and as we said on desic or as I said before, desiccation, but um, can't do that in milling oats and can't do it in malting malt barley 
and farmers are randomly tested for residues as they deliver the grain. <coughs> there are also a few people talking about, when we're in, in um, Canada, about the adjuvants, so the oils and the wettest, the surfactants that we're using in spraying, and people have assumed that they are not toxic, but there have been quite a few scientific papers published where they've shown that these adjuvants can actually have negative health effects. So there is a, the issue is, is it actually glyphosate or is it the products that are in the glyphosate to cause in the glyphosate drum as the adjuvant, adjuvants which are the problem rather than the chemical. But much more work needs to be done on that area. <coughs> These are some of the, in, in um, Canada, some of the chemistry or chemicals that farmers are looking at as they're not replacements for glyphosate, but in addition to with other herbicides, they might be useful. And I don't know how many of these, sorry, you have, but I know you have this one. Do you have the others or not? I know the, chemis the chemical names might be different, but the actual active, so you might have some more of those. But that's what Canadians are looking at as a possible replacement, or replacement's a wrong, wrong word, as a possible product to reduce their reliance on glyphosate. So at the moment, we don't have a systemic herbicide, which is a knockdown replacement. We can look at things like paraquat and diquat, but they, they're not very good, on, especially on broadleaf weeds. We, the, there won't be, well, it's unlikely that there will be glyphosate tolerant crop zones, so yields will decline. No desiccation, especially important in Canada, possible with paraquat, but paraquat is extremely poisonous as well, as you all know. The costing structures will change. Ploughing has very negative environmental impacts. And, but that doesn't mean that we, should not, that we should ignore this problem. We should actually look at how can we use herbicides more effectively so that we use less herbicide rather than the current um, level of herbicide we're doing. And this is a, a photo. Do you have black grass in? Argentina? Mm -hmm. Do you? Black grass. <coughs> it's a weed. Elio, <coughs> Elio, mm, I'll have to look it up. Sorry, David. <coughs> this is just a, this is the last slide. This is a picture in the UK. And when Anne and I were there, we saw all these black fields from a distance. and. We said, what crop is black? And then you walk into them and there's more black grass in these paddocks than there is, that's wheat underneath and black grass over the top. And those farmers are saying, if they ban glyphosate in the in, um, UK, it's gonna get much worse because black grass is resistant to many, many herbicides, but not yet to, well, there's possibly one case that is resistant to glyphosate. <coughs> so do you, does, does it grow in Argentina or not? No. Well, you're lucky, and we are lucky too <laughs> that we don't have it. But so. Okay. So just briefly, I mentioned before the GRDC who made this study for reality. And you can see a little bit of information. So the farmers are leading it, the annual budget, and where the funding comes from. And thank you for your attention. And Anne and I have had a wonderful time in Argentina, traveling around, meeting people. I wish that our Spanish was better, but with our two fantastic interpreters, being David and Ines, <laughs> it's been a dream run. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, yes, <laughs> sure.
alguna pregunta la puede hacer en castellano y la podemos traducir, intentar hacer una traducción. ¿No? ¿No? Andrés, ¿qué tal? Hay una duda con la importancia de estos sistemas que se terminan adosando a la cosechadora como, digamos, como control mecánico de las semillas de óleo. Y había una tabla donde tenía una ponderación de 7 y no me quedó claro si era la importancia que ellos le daban al sistema o la adopción. Ah, ok. Pero eso era el control. ¿Eh? Es el control. El control. De 1 a 9, como que, o 0 a 9, 0 el más sí, pobre, 0 a 9. Ahí está. Ah. Era... Pero, ¿querés, ¿querés volver a verlo? Uh, the table where you have the different... Okay. Track, okay. Uh, the different ways of control. The one with the survey with the numbers. Oh, okay. This, This one. one. <coughs> Okay, so th that's the opinion of the farmers. So we asked the farmers if, if you didn't have glyphosate, how will you control different weed types? And this one is only the answer for annual ryegrass, so lolium multiflorum. And that's what the answers that they... So they first talked about what options they have, And then, as a group, they rated them. Okay. Seven is better. <laughs> so the wheat seed destructor. So that's the grinding wheel on the back of the harvester that crunches everything up. There's no um, seeds coming out out of the back of the header, and they say that that is a is very good. But I think this number is also. <coughs> Maybe farmers are a bit optimistic because it's new technology. It's brand new technology. And it doesn't get all the seed. Some's already fallen. Yeah, true. And But so it's only what's gone through the harvest. Yeah, so it is really important to do the harvesting on time to, for this to work. But if you've got 5,000 hectares and you've got two harvesters, it takes a month to do the harvest. So the, the last week or two weeks, the ryegrass has already dropped its seed. So it won't work for those. And I don't think co contractors will ever put them on because the harvester goes about half the speed or something like that. So it takes a long time. Okay. No? I, I have one question. How, how do the farmer manage the difference between among years that you show that you have high rainfall, low rainfall, uh, from the economic point of view, how do the farm managers, do they have uh, help from the government in those extremely dry years? Um, the only help from the government they get is that if their income is extremely low, they get unemployment benefits. Okay. So unemployed people get a small amount of money to survive, and farmers get it as well, but farmers find that insulting, okay. and they don't <laughs> like that. So quite often, they don't ask for that government money. But, but that's the only support okay. that they get. Okay. The answer to the question is important to that. Oh, sorry. The question is also how do farmers manage the variability, and so we can now talk about how they fertilize and how they respond okay. to inputs, right? So, for a, let's, thank you, David. So, in Australia, when farmers are applying nitrogen fertilizer, they never apply it pre-sowing or at sowing. It's oh. only applied in the crop. So, for example, if we're starting the year and it's a very good year with lots of rainfall in April, May and June, then farmers will put out a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. If it's very dry in May and June, then they'll put it at either no fertilizer or very small amount. I'm just talking about nitrogen fertilizer mm -hmm. because phosphorus fertilizer has to be sown with the seed because our soils are extremely low in phosphorus, a very old continent, and phosphorus levels are very low. So that, that's, that's always applied. But nitrogen fertilizer is applied in crop and can be 
usually either once or twice, but sometimes in a really good year, they might put a very late application on this one. Does that answer okay. the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. No? Then I thought David. <laughs> Con respecto al cambio de glifosato por otros herbicidas, reemplazar, por así decirlo, glifosato por otros herbicidas, esos otros herbicidas, como por ejemplo Paraquat, Diquat, que menciona, nosotros acá estamos usando, además de esos, el glufosinato, otros herbicidas que son de una clase toxicológica más preocupante que el glifosato. ¿Cómo lo piensan o cómo lo ven? en base a este gran cambio, gran desafío. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure I have it. I mean, that's a. I mean, that's obviously what is. It's the key question, which is going to happen, but unfortunately, it's a political decision. It's not based on science, and it's a decision that Europe is going to make, and it's not too different to the decision that was made in this region, where one of your was he the governor or something who decided that there's going to be no chemicals used in that area. So, you know, how do farmers in that region respond to that issue? Now, it's, it's only a thousand metres, which is very bad for the farmers that live in that thousand metres, but if that becomes the whole, the whole province or the whole country, then that's going to have devastating effects. And I think the same will happen if we ban glyphosate. We can reduce the rate of glyphosate we're using, we can use it better, but I can't see how we can continue no-till farming with all its benefits without a product such as glyphosate. Which is not so toxic. Actually. Hmm. But is glyphosate toxic? Well, <laughs> suppose. <laughs> I mean, they struggle to find it, but they find it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Do you have another one? Podría preguntar. Una pregunta. Pero otra pregunta es, por ejemplo, para utilizar mucho por lo que se ve herbicidas para desecar cultivos para después consumirlos. Acá hay algunos cultivos que se utilizan con esa con esa finalidad de desecar el cultivo para poder cosecharlo y después comercializarlo. Glifosato se detecta a través de residuos de glifosato o de AMPA. En cambio, herbicidas como por ejemplo Paraquat no se detecta. Entonces también esto, ¿cómo, ¿cómo se puede llegar a ver en un futuro si se van a adecuar? ¿Qué pasa si se empieza a detectar Paraquat o, o estos herbicidas más peligrosos? ¿Qué problemas se van a encontrar si se van a bajar el glifosato o sus residuos? Desiccation. What impact? Oh, sorry, resulting from crop desiccation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So in, in Canada, where the crop desiccation is most common, they, the, the farmers we talked with said they will buy grain dryers, so using fossil fuels to dry the grain, and they said that is much slower than using glyphosate, and their harvest period is very small because of expected snow and they don't think that they can, they have to buy more machinery and grain dryers to be able to, to do it. But they said they can do it and one farmer said, I'll just sell the farm and go to the Bahamas and live on my boat. So he's not, so we had that response. They also swathed, so yeah. cut the crop before, before harvest, which is what they did before for yeah. But um, that takes three times longer uh, and yeah. it's more costly. 
Yeah, they, they were definitely already using um, paraquat in some situations, but once again, for malt barley and oats for use for human consumption, they're all tested. Not every load is tested, but randomly tested. And they have to be low the man, minimum residue level. But so paraquat will have the same issue as glyphosate has, but it, it's well, paraquat is especially poisonous to humans while we are applying and using the product, but it, that's different to having it in the grain. Mm. Okay. Ready? Okay. Anyone other? Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. But I would really like to thank everyone, and not only in this audience, but also for the last two weeks with all the fantastic experience that the four of us have had in traveling around Argentina, meeting very nice people. David can eat his huge steaks that he loves eating. <laughs> and it's been a really great experience. So my thank you to all of you as well. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Okay. Um, okay.